Hi everyone and welcome back. This video is a discussion of the book Hold On to Your Kids. Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers. The two authors of the book are Gordon Neufeld and Gabor Maté. The book was originally published in 2004, but a revised edition came out in 2013. And I will briefly talk about the difference, the main difference in that revised edition. Before getting into the book, just a quick note about something else, about my reading group. I have a reading group that meets every Sunday, Sunday mornings, Eastern time. And we are starting this Sunday a series of discussions of Immanuel Kant's work, one of his works on ethics, fundamental principles of the metaphysics of morals. It's a relatively short work. We will stay with it for three weeks. After the three weeks, we will move on to the critique of practical reason. So check out the schedule if you're interested. Check out the text. See if you are if you would like to join us. I usually announce the group whenever there is an opening. There's an opening, uh, a convenient point for new members to join in. And whenever we are transitioning from one text to another text, it's a that's a good time. And the group is in general very open to to new members. We are not an academic group. You don't need to have an uh, an academic background. Just an interest and a willingness to read and discuss. All right, to the topic at hand. <laughs> I mean, to the topic of this video. This book, Hold On To Your Kids, is incredibly valuable, in my opinion, in helping us understand the parent-child relationship, the relationship that is really at the heart of society and culture, the parent-child relationship to understand the challenges of that relationship from both sides, the child's side and the adult side. The book is written to guide the parents' attention to, towards what is truly important, what they should focus on and what they should not focus on, but often mistakenly end up focusing on, and what parents should feel responsible for, at parents, adults, caregivers, and what they should do with that responsibility. So it's not just about feeling responsible for something, but how to translate that sense of responsibility into action in a way that is effective. The main point of the book is that parents or caregivers or adults are the responsible parties in the relationship with the children. Okay, that seems very straightforward, almost needless to say. But how that responsibility sh should be taken up and acted on is easy to misunderstand. What is important, what should be nurtured, is not an effective method of controlling kids. So you're responsible for kids, for your kids. That responsibility shouldn't be translated into an effective method of controlling, an effective method of rewarding and punishing. It is not an effective set of rules that you should put in place, rules and regulations at home. It's not even about telling your children that you love them with words. It's not about any of those things. What is important, what we should focus on, is the relationship itself, the bond, the quality of that bond, how the child feels in the presence of his or her caregiver. So that quality of the bond, quality of the relationship shows up in the, in the way a child feels securely, in a, the, the sense of trust, a sense of safety, a sense of being, and knowing that somebody appreciates their, their being unconditionally, recognizes them, regard, regards them. The quality of the attachment relationship, in other words, is what matters. Everything else, everything else that seems important to parents should be rooted in that relationship, should be based on that relationship and flow out of that relationship. So that relationship, that bond is the is the basis, is the ground, everything else, like the child's independence, for example, the child's autonomy. That is not something that, uh, according to the authors, that is not something that parents should be directly working on the child's independence and autonomy. Do this, do this independently. Just like how when you take care of flowers, uh, when you take care of some plants, you don't pull and stretch the plants and say, grow up, grow up faster. What you do is that you nurture the plant and the plant itself grows. In a similar way, in the relationship with children, we nurture their dependence on us. We nurture that relationship. And the child's independence, the child's autonomy, grows organically 
within that context. All right, so the book is really about when that attachment isn't strong enough and, and or when it breaks down. What happens when that attachment breaks down? In that scenario, children still need to form attachment. They still need to get a sense of familiarity and belonging. So a sense of familiarity in the world, that is one of the functions of attachment. They, they still need that. As a result, what happens? Children then tend to form atta attachment with their peers, with other children around their own age. They become, in the, in the author's words, they become peer-oriented as opposed to parent-oriented. And since attachment is exclusive, what does that mean? Attachment is exclusive. That means atta attachment is a winner-takes-all, at least uh, prior to maturity. That means children can either be attached to their parents, form attachment to their parents, or to their peers. And if they form that attach attachment to their peers, they end up pushing the parents away because of the nature of attachment, that it's a winner-take-all and exclusive uh, mechanism. So this is the central distinction in the book, the central distinction between two modes of orientation in kids, being parent-oriented versus being peer-oriented. And the argument in the book is that it's better. One of those is superior, preferable to the other. When parents see the signs of peer-oriented child, they don't recognize it as what it is. Because being peer-oriented is really something that is happening at a deeper level in the psychology of children. Parents don't see a child and say, oh, look at that peer-oriented child. No, what they see, what they confront is relatively more superficial signs and symptoms of that, like defiance like uh, disagreeing with the parent or avoiding the parent. So they, they recognize the child as defiant, as willful, as stubborn. And in that situation, they might feel helpless or powerless uh, when it comes to the behavior of the child. They might resort to force, to threat, in order to regain their lost control. They might even give up. They might you know, to compensate for their feeling of hopelessness and powerlessness, they might come up with some silly explanation like blaming the child's DNA or the child's personality type to say that it wasn't really their fault. They were just unlucky to end up with a difficult child. It's like my child was always stubborn. So that's not really a, a solution. What parents should do instead is to develop, try to develop, try to go back and develop that thing that, is, that was lost, develop the attachment and trust with their children. And the book argues why peers cannot replace parents, should not replace, and it really cannot. There are certain functions that cannot be fulfilled with peers. Only parents can truly guide children to prevent them from being lost. Peer orientation can only give kids the feeling that they are not lost. And that feeling is an illusion. And it's a case of, as the authors put it, it's a case of blind leading the blind. Only adults can enable the child's connection to culture, to the society's past. So here's an, an example that really embodies this, the necessity of adults, adult attachment in cultural development of children. The example is how peer-oriented children talk, how they use language. And when we pay attention to their use of language, we realize that their use of language is relatively impoverished. They use very like overly simplified uh, language to communicate with each other. It's almost designed to be excessively simple, like cool or whatever. Lots of, lots of that kind of like mon monosyllabic expressions that don't convey much. The two orientations are also different in their impact on individuality, the individuality that grows in a, in a child. Only adults can help a child achieve individuality or individuation. Becoming uh, distinct, becoming an individual, depends on the safe context of attachment to an adult. Only adults who are providing unconditional regard can recognize and support expressions of individuality. Peers cannot do that. Peers, on, by contrast, Peers encourage conformity and lack of expression, lack of expressions of distinct 
and individual kind. That's why being cool is a stereotypical way of being peer oriented. You're cool, you don't express yourselves. Uh, and you conform to your to how your the rest of your group behaves, the rest of your gang behaves. So it's, it becomes a homogenous uh, group identity. Another reason has to do with vulnerability. Learning to express vulnerability is uh, is important when you when we develop from relationships, when we go move from relationship to relationship, when we expand our social circle. Ideally, what should happen is that we, we learn to become vulnerable more. Our capacity for vulnerability and expression of vulner vulnerability increases. That's the ideal situation. It should not happen that we become colder and colder as we experience and we become more rigid and we stop expressing ourselves and we stop expressing our needs and, and wants. To express what we want and need in our relationship, we need to express vulnerability. We need to become vulnerable. Only by showing emptiness and lack can we be fulfilled, can we be satisfied. We need to communicate uh, the things that we want in our relationships. But these expressions themselves require safety and trust. Children who grow up without a secure attachment, of course, they need to learn to be cool and detached and invulnerable. But invulnerability doesn't mean that you don't need other people anymore. You don't need secure attachment anymore. It just means that you that's you adopt that way of coping. You stop expecting and wanting. The aim of relationship is, as I said, is to increase vulnerability and openness. But peer orientation encourages coolness, not caring, lack of vulnerability, and a kind of not learning from experience, kind of not being a historical being. The authors also give us a very very helpful, very illuminating discussion of bullying, what bullying is, and they characterize it as, they characterize bullying as a dysfunctional attachment pattern. Aggressive behavior by the bully, by the bullies, aggressive behavior in response to a hunger for attachment that is combined with not wanting to be vulnerable or wanting not to be vulnerable. So a bully has that attachment hunger and that is combined with uh, like wanting to be cool and uh, and dominant and not vulnerable in any way. So this is also expressed in the sexual fantasies of peer-oriented children, which is which has nothing to do with care and responsibility. Instead, what they want is dominance and exploitation, which they perceive as safe and preferable. Okay, the book contains a lot of practical tips on healing that relationship, healing the parent-child relationships. But these tips are not techniques. And that's really what I love about this book, that it doesn't give us formula, techniques, methods that you can, um, in a mindless way, just apply like a robot. Um, the tips are concerned with the deeper problem of attachment. The authors talk about collecting the kids, collecting their attention, gaining their trust, entering into their space uh, in a way that is warm, friendly, not demanding, and in a way that shows you value that bond as, a, as an end in itself. So it's a pattern of what, what the authors encourage parent, parents to do to heal that, their relationship with their kids, is to try to enter back into the space of children. At first, that's going to be difficult, but they have to be very careful. Um, and if they're careful, it is, it is possible to do, to do that and slowly heal, heal the bond. Without gaining that attachment, without having the attention of the child, nothing else would work. That's really key. It is important to begin with sharing a space and returning to a bond. The passage that I really like in the book is uh, referring to that, the aim of the relationship. We read that, quote, the ultimate gift is to make the child feel invited to exist exactly as he is, to express our delight in his very being. There are thousands of ways this invitation can be conveyed, end quote. So the ultimate gift is to, to invite the child to exist as they are, as they really are. All right, I talked about the two editions of the 
book, 2004-2013, the, the revised edition includes discussion of social media and internet. Uh, the authors argue how internet and social media were originally intended for information and entertainment. But we discovered that they became primarily, I mean, to a, to a large degree, they became about belonging and bonding. And especially for peer-oriented children or people who were peer-oriented or are, that is a weak point, something that could be exploited with these technologies. Social media is addictive because it doesn't satisfy our needs. It almost satisfy, satisfies our needs. That's why we end up overusing them. Digital intimacy, if, if there is such a thing, intimacy that is enabled with digital technology, it doesn't really deliver. Instead, it, ex it spoils our appetite for true intimacy. Again, that's another uh, point in the, the new chapters. The, the authors echo a sentiment expressed by Neil Postman, who said that parenting is a rebellion against current culture the current way society is functioning now. Parents must mediate between children and society. Parents should stand between how the effects of society are forcing themselves on children. They should not act as agents of society. So there's that sentiment of rebellion. Neil, Post, in Neil Postman that parent, uh, the authors also elaborate on and agree with. Um, the other thing that they argue for is the last thing I mentioned is how new attachments are formed for children. I said that attachment is a, is a, is a winner take all an exclusive mechanism, but of course the, the, this, the circle of attachment can grow. The way it grows is that new attachment to a baby, babysitter, to a tutor or a, to, to a teacher, it can arise from an existing attachment between the child and the parent and between the parent and the other adult. So, Ideally, a child should see this new adult interact with the adult to, which they, to whom they are attached. So a child needs to first spend time with their adult interacting with the, with the new person. So they, their adult, their, <laughs> their caregiver. Uh, in general, it was, really, it was really great to read. Uh, being somewhat familiar with Gabor Mate's writing, I have I've reviewed three books by him so far. There's a lot of Gabor Mate um, material in this book. You can recognize him, his presence. And there's a lot of other material. Gordon Neufeld. Gordon Neufeld is someone that Gabor Mate refers to, cites, as starting his, with, in his first book on a attention deficit disorder. And it was really nice to see them joining forces and writing this book together. Um, but Gordon Neufeld, we, we find in this book that Gordon Neufeld is really the first author and Gabor Mate is more of a collaborator and second author. But the book is really, it, it's unified. We don't see two distinct voices in it. We see one book, which is great. All right, what do you think? Have you read this book? Would you like to read it? I'm not a parent, but I enjoyed reading it. And I think you don't need to be a parent um, to benefit from reading this book. It really is an understanding of human development human relationship, the basis of society, and attachment. Thank you for watching. Um, thanks, uh, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, and I will speak with you in my future videos.